Okay, we are live. <laughs> Here wow. we go. How exciting. So, yeah, welcome everybody to, I guess, a special episode of the Humans and Wildlife show. It's in a little bit of a different format today. Um, but one thing that hasn't changed is that, as usual, we'll be talking about um, a particular humans and wildlife topic. And today we're talking about wildlife and wind power. Um, Christian, do you want to talk a little bit more about, about what that is? Yes. Hi, everyone. So Georgia and I are very excited to see you all. And um, uh, so it's a little bit of a different format before we start. We're not going through HAPS. So we've got several windows open. So please be generous and a little bit tolerant to our technical errors. I've tried to see the comments as they come in. I can I can see Georgia's already. Oh, you're even commenting on Facebook. You're good. <laughs> you're good. <laughs> Hey, that's great. She's clever. Yeah. So that means we're seeing your comments. We'll do our best. Um, so yeah, today's all about wind energy. It's really interesting, our wind power. Um, I'm using energy and power, Georgia. You know what that's yeah. about? <laughs> well, I guess this is, yeah, this is a great introduction to the episode. You know, as usual, last week, Christian and I were talking about what to name the episode. And I wanted to, uh, Wildlife Meets Wind Energy and Christian had to explain to me, physicist, electrical, engineering, kind of knowledgeable guy that he is, he had to explain to me why wind energy is not really accurate. We wanted wind power. So Christian, what's what's the difference between wind energy and power or energy versus power? Okay, Georgia, good point. Let's get right into it. Um, so the, 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 the difference is, is, well, let's say you're driving your car, right? Can be an electric car, even the same thing, whether it's an electric car or whether it's a fuel driven car. But the moment you put something in the tank, you have energy storage there. So you're driving around with energy, right? But the moment you hit the gas pedal, um, that changes into power because it's something that is used per time. So when we come to to wind energy and the same with solar energy is very interesting. We have the word intermittent. It's a bit different, right? Intermittent. So that's really important. That's why I like to actually talk about wind power, not energy, because wind energy as such is not stored. It's always there. It prevails and we use it whenever we can. So it's, it's actually, in that sense, wind power. If you compare that, for example, to a hydro dam where you store water right and you can release it whenever you want that would be called water you know storage and storage is always energy does that make sense somewhat yeah you so you said it really simply last time in a certain way you said like um power is energy per time mm -hmm. is that correct that's correct that's all it is energy per time so it's it's what we use right Right. And, and you know, Georgia, what the difficult thing about electricity is, and I'm, I'm seeing some comments come already, so don't worry, put your comments and questions in, please. Uh, it's yeah. fantastic that you're doing it. We are seeing them. I will just yeah. go and explain a little bit before we, before we rant and rave about energy, whether, uh, wind energy, whether we should or not. I can already see Sarah coming in here with some comments. Uh, before yeah. we should do that, let's talk a little bit about, um, yeah, let's, let's talk a bit about what wind power actually is, okay? Yeah, yeah, so definitely. And we, one of the reasons Christian and I picked wind power for our first topic is that Christian and I have both worked in wind power in, uh, at some point or other. So at one time I worked um, monitoring dead birds and bats killed at wind farms. And that's definitely um, a big topic in, human, in, in wind energy and wildlife. Um, and Christian, what, what's your involvement or what was your involvement with wind turbines? Yeah, I've actually been quite involved. When I, when I lived in the UK, we were then designing what we call UK off offshore wind farms. That's a big topic, right? So that's quite quite a heavy electrical engineering topic. So I thought maybe in the beginning, maybe I just explain a little bit about what wind energy really is or wind power really is. What do you think? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay, and then we'll get right into the animals, which is a big topic too. And that's Georgia's yeah. speciality, especially when it comes to bats. So let me go a little bit and talk about the grid and what it what it really is. So wind wind power sort of started in the early 80s. And at that time, well, you saw these cranky windmills um, typically on the hillsides, right? And they used to have these huge gearboxes in the back. And 
a, what you call a simple induction machine. So that converts mechanical uh, energy that's from the wind, that's wind power basically into electricity. That's the design. So it's just turning something that makes electricity like a generator, right? And they found out that they had lots of problems. The first uh, wind turbines in, uh, actually came from Denmark. Denmark has been a worldwide initiator for, for wind power a long time. In fact, um, Denmark powers 47% of its total country on wind power. That's average over the whole year, which is quite considerable. If you look at the world power, you know, the, the distribution of wind energy across the world, you'll be surprised to know, uh, learn that uh, China is actually the major producer in, in wind power. Together, we produce about 700 and something gigawatts. Don't worry about the word gigawatts, but that's a lot, a lot of power. It's 5% of the world's energy on average is coming from, from, uh, to, from electricity is coming from wind power. So the main contributors, their per capita is definitely, uh, is definitely Denmark. So it's then you're going to say, well, Denmark is in a special position. Yes, it is. A um, little bit of electrical engineering here. Um, the, the problem that you have with, with, with wind power, and it's the same that you have with solar power, is, well, when the wind stops blowing, there is no electricity. That's absolutely true. That's why you try to build these wind farms in, you know, in locations like what we see here in the back, where there's lots of wind going on, right? That's quite that's quite important, uh, but it is intermittent, so it only works well when there is sun or um, well when there is uh, when there is wind, right? Yeah. So and if yeah. I could interject real quick, yeah, of these you can. wind turbines oh. in this picture here that's yeah. showing this is a really good example of wind turbines on a ridge line. You can kind of see how they're on the top of like along where the mountains are going and. Wind turbines on ridge lines are, are going to be a particular an area of particular interest when it comes to um, problematic interactions with wildlife. But we can talk more about that later. Yes, absolutely, absolutely correct. So, so that's exactly why they why they build them there so that they can harvest the wind. Uh, but when when the wind stops blowing, well, it's like what, what Georgia notices now because she's got solar power on the roof, and well, it gets a bit difficult in winter, doesn't it? What happens? <laughs> uh, well, you you run out of energy <laughs> and power, I guess. I don't know. I'm worried about That's which. That's fine. It's both the same. Yeah. You run out of both or either. Yeah. <laughs> And, 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 and that gets, and that gets very annoying, of course. And, and that's why, um, you need the grid as a backup, right? So you have gas power, you have hydropower, you have all these other different, well, you have coal power, of course, still, and so on. And they are, they sort of give the baseline. And then you have intermittent power on top. So you, you, you basically have to balance the grid. And for example, Denmark is very lucky in this because Denmark is right integrated into the European grid. For example, France has a lot of nuclear energy. Energy and so on, which gives a lot of base power. And so they can balance it very nicely. A country like Ireland, it's a bit more difficult. They are, you know, sort of on the on the limb and their balance is a little bit more difficult. So that's the thing that you have to really balance things when it comes to wind, right? So just like you have to balance your house. Yeah, definitely. And like Christian's comments are referring to, um, I'm currently living off grid in terms of my power, electricity and my uh, water and so yes, I'm I am very uh, sympathetic to challenges that come with not having a backup grid system. But yeah, yeah. let's talk a little bit more. Um, I think we don't have to pull people in the chat to know that a lot of people um, have uh, are not happy with wind turbines necessarily because they associate them potentially with killing birds, right? Um, killing animals, birds and and bats. And so I'll just start with um, a comment that we had yeah, go previously ahead. submitted. Um, so one of our longtime viewers, David Howden, he asked on email, um, one thought I have is that wind turbines, um, I remember reading some time ago that they're particularly problematic for bats because the pulses of air they produce can damage the delicate eardrums of bats. I'm not sure it was a particularly reliable source. I'd read those, so better to ask who better to ask about it than you? Yeah, so um, bats are my animal of specialty. I am a wildlife biologist, but mostly I study bats. And and David's comment is interesting. It's partially correct, I would say. Um, yeah, I don't know if you want to bring up, Christian, some of the pictures of bats, but what, what we find in most 
in most places, most wind farms, most of the animals killed there are actually bats, not birds. Um, so when I worked at a wind farm, we walked basically 10 miles a day doing transects, um, walking in lines around these wind turbines to see what animals they had killed each day. And I would say the whole summer we found maybe a couple dead birds, but we found a lot of dead bats, like hundreds of dead bats. And we weren't even looking under all the turbines at the wind farm. Um, we were just looking under a subset of them and then, you know, sort of extrapolating from there. But just only looking under a few turbines, we had found uh, a bunch of dead bats and some living bats, actually. A lot of them get confused and disoriented and knocked to the ground and are still alive or partially alive. Um, so the the thing, the big mystery is why, is why so many bats? Why do bats seem so confused by these things when the birds don't seem to be... Um, getting killed in as high of numbers. And this picture of the bird dead is a great example because the couple birds I found dead, they look like this. They were like in pieces. I would find like the head over here and then like the back side of the bird, like, you know, um, you know, like uh, like 20 meters away or something. This thing was like chopped. Whereas usually the, I've never found a bat in pieces. The bat has died with usually without any physical sign of injury on the outside. Um, it's kind of like this bat here. It's just lying there dead. There's no broken bones, no gashes in it. And so this is a, this is a big mystery, right? Why, why are the bats so affected? Um, and the David's source that talks about the bat's eardrums is kind of partially correct. So what, what they think happens with bats is something, they die by something called barotrauma, which is basically um, that wind turbine is spinning so fast oftentimes that it actually creates a lower pressure area in front of the turbine. And um, bats are particularly sensitive to that low pressure change, it turns out. So birds um, birds aren't as sensitive there. And what, what the difference is, is birds, like their internal organs are just like held a little bit more tightly, like their connective tissue and stuff like that is more dense. Um, but the bats like connective to, they're basically like more loosey goosey inside. They're not held together quite as tightly. And so the bats are basically more sensitive to that sudden pressure change in the air than the birds are. And so the bats enter that low pressure area and they have um, barotrauma, it like, leads to like internal bleeding and stuff like that, where there's no visible injury on the outside, but they have basically died they didn't even touch the blades of the turbine probably, they just got near it and then died because of the low pressure. Um, and sometimes sometimes we do find bats where they have um, like a broken bone or forearm or something like that, their wings are broken, but usually there's no visible injury, so. You know, that's very, that's very interesting that you say that, Georgia, because um, of course, you know, we often underestimate how much power such such a um, you know such a single blade has. I can give you an example: a single rotation of uh, the, the the largest wind turbine, and that's much larger than the one that that, that you were at, because these are new ones that go offshore. But the, a single rotation can power a house for two days. Can you believe it? Just a single rotation, just to give you how much, you know, feeling how much energy this is, right? This is, wow. so, so it's, it's, it's a lot. And, you know, if you look at the weight of, of the biggest uh, wind turbines, let me just uh, explain that a little bit. So you're talking about the, 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 the new ones that are coming offshore. Um, the, the, the length of the blade is, is, is about 100 meters, that's over 300 feet now, right? It's uh, 12 megawatts, it's huge. These these wind turbines uh, dwarf any large jumbo jet, you know, that, that you know. And uh, I think the, uh, let me just look it up, the um, the weight of a turbine is somewhere, uh, of, of a single uh, blade is about 110,000 pounds, right? So this is huge, right? This is... Um, yeah. Well, and not just the weight, but so also the speed, because you see these wind turbines from sort of far away, you know, when you're driving or whatever, and it looks very relaxing. You're like, oh, they're twirling around, like peaceful. But when you're standing under one, it's it's very, yeah, it's very disorienting because they're so big, you don't realize so how big. fast they're going too. When you're standing under them, each blade is going whoop, and like creates a ton of wind underneath it. Yes. Even Like, yes. so when you're walking around under them, 
you're you're aware at like a whole different scale that like wow at the ends these things are going very fast you know it's interesting that mohammed writes here in egypt we shut down our wind turbines uh on the Red Sea during bird migration season. I've never heard of it. That's really interesting. I got I got to look that up, Mohammed. That's a that's a very interesting comment. Yeah, and so, mm. so yeah, Mohammed brings up a really good point, which is that you know I presented this negative image of like, oh my gosh, all these bats are dying at the wind turbines and potentially birds, but there are workarounds for this. There are very good. Once we I better understand what the problem is, we understand when birds and bats are dying and why then we're better able to address, um, to come up with solutions. So for example, one big problem is that birds and bats die in much higher numbers at, at wind farms during migration season, because during migration, and a lot of people don't know bats migrate, but they do, many species do. And so when birds and bats are migrating, they're traveling these long distances and they're much more likely to come into contact with the wind turbines just because they're they're flying around more, but also because the areas that are good for wind farms are also really good migration route it, routes, it turns out. So birds and bats like to migrate along ridge lines, like we saw those wind turbines set up along the ridge line, and they also like to migrate along coastlines, um, it's where a lot of offshore wind energy facilities are located. Um, or potentially, like here in the Great Lakes, they were gonna, they were thinking of putting in a bunch of offshore turbines, and it turned out it was at a very important um, crossing point where a lot of birds would fly, cut across one of the big lakes um, during their migration, and so they decided not to put a wind energy facility there. Mm -hmm. um, so, so one solution is that you can temporarily turn off the turbines when migration is happening, you're like, oh, a lot of birds are killed then, let's not have the wind the wind farms going. Um, another thing that they can do is they can reduce, they can change the cut-in speed of when the turbine turns on. So you can say, for example, um, okay, birds and bats die when the wind is low. They're not flying around when the wind is going super fast. So they're like, okay, well, we don't get very much energy anyways when the wind is slow and that's when all the birds and bats are flying. So let's say, okay, wind turbine, don't turn on unless the wind is blowing at least like 15 kilometers per hour. Otherwise like stay like locked. Um, and so that's another solution that, that people can use to try to um, have wind power, but also not be killing a, a lot of animals. Yeah, that makes complete sense. And actually, that's a type of win-win, uh, George. It's very good. So if you look at the wind speed, the energy goes into the square of the wind speed. So that's good. So when Georgia says at a certain speed, you know, if, you, if the speed doubles, the wind energy would, would quadruple. Uh, so that's actually a win-win because, you know, as the energy get, as as the wind picks up, you know, the, the, the turbines really start uh, harvesting the wind properly. So I, I actually like that. It's good. Yeah, and we have um, another comment from David Howden on YouTube. Um, the height at which they migrate seems relevant. Seen some studies of that in seabirds with lightweight data loggers. Any studies on bat migration height? Um, yes, there are studies on bat migration height. It is, um, we, we still don't know though what, what height a lot of bats migrate. There was a few years ago um, a fighter jet that hit a bat at um, a mile above ground, I believe. And so that astounded people because they didn't think that the bats flew so high. Um, but uh, we, it's, it's pretty hard. A lot of bats are smaller than birds. And so that makes it harder to use these um, data, to put these data loggers on their backs that are able to get refined information like about how high they're flying and stuff. Um, they have worked on bat deterrence from wind turbines. Actually, Christian, I don't know if you have a picture I sent yep. you of the purple wind turbine, One but that was- left. I'm sure I do, wait a second. Um, just, just, yeah, so I, in addition to just like migrating bats, hitting the turbines, there's some one, speculation no. that the bats are actually attracted to the wind turbines. Um, okay, the purple one. Sorry, let me just go through. No, that's okay. Yeah, you can just scroll through pictures. People will, people will know it when they see it. Um, but there's some evidence that some bats are attracted to the wind turbines. 
And that's because um, some species, they, but basically in the fall, a lot of bats have like big mating orgies and some species use like really tall, prominent trees that stick out on the landscape as like a um, convening point for these big orgies. And so there's some speculation that like the bats see this wind turbine and they're like, oh, that's a great marker. That's like this, that's like a big tree. That's where all the other bats are gonna be going to form a big mating swarm. Like that's how the bats, they look for landscape features like that to find mates basically. Um, so there is some speculation that the bats were attracted to these turbines because they looked like good spots to find mates at. Um, there's also speculation that the white color of the turbine would attract insects at night. So like, I guess because it's just a lighter color and maybe it reflects the moonlight or something better that like it would be a good place to get insects. And so that's where the solution of painting the turbines purple came from. Some people were like, oh, let's, let's paint the turbines purple and maybe they'll attract less insects. Um, there are also people that try to set up like um, basically like annoying acoustic devices that would like make a sound that would send the bats away. Um, yeah, so there's like a lot of different solutions that people have been trying to get the bats to stay away from the turbines, but it's complicated because it's can still confusing why the bats die at the turbines in the first place. Like there's migration, there's mating, there's the possibility that they're attracting insects slash food for the bats. And so there's like a lot of reason <laughs> when you don't fully understand why the bats are dying at the turbines, like why they're coming into contact with them so much, it's difficult to find a solution. Um, but people have definitely been working on it and trying a lot of different things, including painting turbines purple. How interesting, Georgia. But of course, the first thing that would come to my mind is is the that you know the sound that wind turbines make because the tip of the blades are actually moving incredibly fast that's why there's a limitation to how big you can make the blades because uh, there's no material eventually that will that will hold the stress they make typically they're made typically of glass fibers they weigh weigh a lot and they bend more and more and they are also changing the blade angle all these things are making sound they're changing the you know the, the turbine into the wind they're correcting all these things so there are a lot of um, there are probably some very high frequency sounds that bats can hear that we cannot hear. I'm sure they've examined that, right? So, yeah, and they've they've had a, a problem, I think, where like there's these high frequency sounds that you would want to use to deter the bats, like you just said. But the high frequency sounds, it's really hard to get a high frequency sound to travel very mm -hmm. far with any appropriate loudness. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I I should have looked up more on like the where the progress of that research or those efforts are now but they've been trying with i would say mixed or limited success um to use that method yeah because mohammed is saying but the wind turbines produce scary sounds already he's right <laughs> how come they don't hear them i'm sure in the higher frequency range there must be a a lot we don't hear george i'm i'm convinced especially at the tips uh, of, of 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 the turbine Wow, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it yeah. could be that, you know, we think of a, a high frequency mm -hmm. sound as annoying, but yeah. to a bat, they're used it's to hearing subtractive. high. That's, that's where they, it's like a normal sound range. Yes. For them. You're like, oh, this is just like a grumbling sound or something. And I can see them, you know, just getting used to it. Or exactly. To it. Yeah. They, my speculation is pure speculation would be, they're probably hearing frequencies they find interesting that's attracting them. You know, that's, that's, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, hey, this is this is a very interesting subject. But you you, you know, put, um, so Georgia, tell us a little bit about the background. You spent quite some time there. So, how many dead birds did you actually find when you were there? You know, at, at, I think just two. Two, and oh. like I think that might have been mm -hmm. like all of us working there collectively just mm -hmm. found two, or maybe it was me. Me, there was like five of us doing these surveys roughly, um, or maybe. Yeah, I think maybe just like we as people only found two. I remember that I found a Western meadowlark, which was my first time seeing that species. I was it, it kind of has like two feathers that make little horns on it, its head and it has a little bit of yellow on its chest. And I was like, oh, what is this bird? And it's the type of bird that you, I guess I see it all, I notice it quite often now, but I had never really looked at one closely before until I saw its dead halves of its body. Um, 
But yeah, not that many birds die. But I, I will talk about a couple ways that we um, kind of carefully try to count how many animals are getting killed at the wind farm, because a lot more goes into it than you might think. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that we would do is we would always start at sunrise. So a lot of the animals are dying at night, including the birds, because the birds are migrating at night. And that's maybe part of why they don't see the turbine as well. Um, but anyway, so we would start at sunrise. And that's where all those beautiful, that's why I have all those beautiful sunrise yeah. pictures of wind of wind turbines that I sent you, Christian, because okay, that's I had so many. I put some on. There you go. Yeah, like that. That's, wow. Um, that's, I, what's I happening see. in this picture is I'm like sitting in the car, probably waiting for it to get light enough to start walking around and looking. And so we start looking as soon as it's light enough to see. That way there's wow. less time for like, you know, a dog or something to come and like eat the dead bodies. So you want to start counting before, as soon as you can, that way there's not an opportunity for like scavenging animals to like take the bodies away because then you wouldn't, you wouldn't know. Georgia, wouldn't you, are, are, Georgia, are you an early riser? I just have to know. <laughs> I am actually. So Good. Despite, <laughs> yeah. Despite the fact that I study bats, I love to wake up early. Uh, that's like me. Person. Yeah. I just wanted I'm, to know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm like in the wrong field. I really struggle on the night's when I'm out um, catching bats, you know, and you that stay out till well. like 3 a.m. or something, and I'm like, oof, mm -hmm. gosh. Um, but that yeah, so beautiful. so we, yeah, one way we try to get an accurate count is to start at um, the beginning of the day. In this particular area, this is um, a wind farm in Ohio in the United States. Um, but in this particular area, the wind turbines were in an agricultural area, an area where they grow lots of corn. And they paid the farmers to not plant any corn right under the wind turbine. Um, that way, it was just bare dirt and it was easier for us to count, easier, easier for us to see things. Um, a lot of wind farms, even wind farms where they're trying to do these um, dead animal surveys, a lot of wind farms, people are not so lucky. Sometimes there's like, it's in a forest basically, and you're not, your chances of seeing something that was killed is like very, very low. So we were really lucky on this project that just how they arranged the survey was actually um, set up really well for us to actually be able to see the things that were killed. Um, but one thing that they do to try to account for what proportion of the things killed are we actually finding one thing they do is they'd actually take animals that were dead. Like there's some person on the team that's in charge of doing this. They would take like previously dead animals and put like a little tag or marker on them and go and lay them out at night. And then, so like then there's a portion of animals that are out there to find that someone put there. They weren't killed by the turbine. And so then they can say like, oh, okay, the people that were out there counting found, you know, 90% of the like fake dead bats that we put out, or they found 100%, or like over the course of two days, they found all of them, but it, you know, they missed like 10% on the first day or something like that. So that's one way of, um, they were basically getting a number for how many, what proportion of the things that are killed, like, are the people out there going to find? Does that make sense? That's very, that's very interesting, Georgia, really. I, I hope you're not getting too much background noise at the moment, so I'm just a bit worried about, uh, you know, about my uh, phone. But, but uh, you, you know, that's very interesting. I just wanted to quickly bring in a, a comment here from Phil. It's very relevant. If everyone, and I know this is the way Georgia actually lives, if everyone turned off the lights in rooms, they wouldn't be using a massive, oh. there wouldn't be a massive reduction in electricity demand. You, there would be a, you know, that's what he means. So it's, it, that is the number one thing, you know, it's, it's the heating that is too high in houses and it's the lighting. Isn't it surprising you say that, Phil? I grew up exactly that way. My father used to really get upset if we didn't turn off the lights. Nobody, nobody gets upset anymore. So I, I completely agree with you. That's a great message. Absolutely. Yeah, my mom is like that too. And well, one of this is a bit off topic, but one of the things I've started doing um, since, as you mentioned, Christian, I live off grid and my energy is very limited and heating takes up a lot of energy. Wow. I've realized a lot. Of, so heating your water and also heating, you know, your air. Um, so one thing I've started doing is I actually sleep like with a water bottle in my bed at night 
And well, first of all, I fill it with hot water and that helps keep me warm at night so that like I don't have to use as much energy heating air. But then in the morning, that water is like body temperature or a little bit warmer. And that's the water I use for like washing my face and stuff or maybe for making my tea. And so that way I'm not heating up like water that's really cold. It's winter here right now. I'm not heating up water from the tap that's really cold. I'm heating up water for tea that's already starting off at kind of like my body temperature. And I think that helps me save uh, energy. I think that's brilliant. You know, water, it all, I, I'm, I'm always amazed how much, how many good properties water has. I mean, I just have to talk about water a little bit because it's just so yeah. amazing. But Georgia is using water in a very efficient way because, first of all, water has a lot of heat capacity, right? That's why, you know, you have these incredible inventions of, of water bottles, which she takes to her bed and it's so efficient, you know, because it lasts a long time. The other thing that absolutely strikes me about water, I just have to mention it, is that the density of water doesn't go down the colder it gets. It's miraculously the maximum density that water has, sorry, I should say the, uh, yeah, the maximum density is at 4.2 degrees Celsius, which corresponds to just, a, uh, um, I don't know whether it's 37, 38 uh, Fahrenheit, I don't, know, I don't know the exact conversion, which actually means that biologically the, the, the um, oceans don't freeze up from the bottom. It never gets colder than that. That's a, that's incredible for for the meaning of life because otherwise you would have the oceans freeze up from the bottom. The the heavy ice would sink to the bottom, and there would it would be dead down there. It's not. So I just had to talk about this incredible the incredible properties of water. Yeah. So. No, I think that's totally awesome. It sounds like we're gonna have to have like a side episode at some point on um, yes. like the I don't know the amazing like like. I don't know, qualities of water that yes. help, like, make life possible or something mm. like that. Maybe more of like a physics oriented ep episode, but a lot of the properties you're talking about, like mm. that's why fish can still live in lakes exactly. in, um, in Northern climates exactly. like this or places that get really cold like this is because the lake doesn't freeze from the bottom, like only yeah. the top freezes. And um, yeah, it's, and it's, in, it's incredible that ice is lighter than, uh, than liquid water. I mean, if you think about it, that's not true for any other solid that I know. It's just so unique about water. It's just incredible. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. I'm just looking at some other comments, uh, Georgia. Yeah. One second. Um, so, can could we? Oh, yeah. If, yeah, I can. I actually see a lot of interesting comments. Could you Go find ahead. that picture of the dog to put up? Yes, There's the like dog. Uh, I hope I have all your pictures. You mean this one here? That one? Uh, Yes. So I wanted okay. to mention really quickly that like, because I was talking about improving or measuring how good we are at finding the animals that are killed under turbines. One thing that people have done is they've actually trained, they started training dogs to find the carcasses of birds and bats that are killed under turbines. Um, because in some areas, like you can see, it's really grassy here. The dogs are better, are going to be better at finding dead things than the people are. Um, so like if, you know, they're looking with their nose and not so much with their eyes, like we might be. And so this is like an example of an area where you can see it might be hard to see like little dead birds and bats in the grass, but that dog is going to be able to find them like pretty well because he or she is trained to sniff out dead birds and, and bats. Yeah. And did that help? Yeah. So in, I, th I think like in an area where I was working, where the ground is very clear. People are just as good as a dog, but in areas like this, the dog is going to be better than the human at finding um, the dead animals that are killed. Yeah. You must have had quite a morning walk every time because those wind turbines are usually seven blade distances apart, right? That's the typical distance between wind turbines. So if I think about it, you you must have had quite a you know quite a run for it. <laughs> so. We we I walked ten miles every day. Yeah. <gasps> 10 miles, Georgia. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And a, a lot of it was, we wouldn't even do that many turbines, but you walk like very, we would have like a flags set up all around in a circle around the turbine. And so you'd walk like one flag to the other, turn next flag wow. to the other. Because you can only look like so, so mm. far on either side of you. You know what I mean? And so that way you would just like walk back and forth under the turbine and then you know, you've seen all of it. So even sometimes I find myself still when I'm like walking on the sidewalk, like 
uh, just habitually like scanning to either side, <laughs> like looking for dead things. But Christian, you were right. We have so many comments on Facebook and YouTube. Yeah, do you want to read some out? Is yeah, so um, one comment, another comment from David Howden, some insects also use high points to coordinate mating. Not heard that they use turbines, but suppose they might. David, I actually do remember, I would, I was surprised at I would find dead moths and butterflies on the ground too when I was doing these surveys. And I remember wondering like, oh, I wonder if anyone's studying this. Like, and I also like, I wonder if the insects are attracted to the turbines or they're just happening to be killed as the blades are going around. But I mean, I think that's an interesting question that I'm not sure anyone has looked at. Um, and <laughs> Gentleman Ghost comments, I hate to double down on last week's statement, but will migrating birds learn to avoid wind turbines, uh, wind turbine areas in future years migration? Couldn't birds not affected, killed, pass on that knowledge? Or am I overestimating learning slash instinct um, yeah, G Gentleman Ghost is referring to his comment. I remember last week he commented, um, we were talking about birds dying from hitting glass windows. And and he had a similar comment. Um, Georgia, just quickly, I'm sorry to, to, to interrupt, mm -hmm. but where are you seeing these comments? I'm so happy that David Howden and Gentleman Ghost are here because I can't see them. Where, where? I'm on the YouTube. I had to, scroll, oh, you're on I had YouTube. to scroll up in the comments, though, because, um, okay. because there are a lot of comments. You are so, smart. That's good. Yeah. So it does work on YouTube because I'm sorry to say that I, I couldn't find it on YouTube. So I'm glad, oh, okay. I'm glad it's working. Great. Well done. Well done. I'll be sure okay. to look at those comments. And, so, yeah. Um, so gentleman goes, I think mm -hmm. it could happen. You're right. Like the ones that don't die, if they figured out like, oh, if you go too close to that big white thing, you die. And I'm like teaching my offspring how, or how to like migrate in a very specific way, then maybe there's a potential for that. But it is kind of asking a lot. Um, it's, it's a lot for a bird or a bat, I think, to like, to not themselves die, but instead see like, oh, their friend or something get killed by the wind turbine. And then they're like, oh, wait, I shouldn't go by that thing. Um, it's like death is not a very good teacher. And so the ones that actually experience the turbines are probably dying. Um, and the ones that don't die, but go near a turbine probably like flew over the turbine, but like didn't really maybe take note of it or something. So I think that, I think there is some potential, but I think that it's it's quite a difficult challenge if you're an animal or something to figure that out, especially because a turbine is so different from a predator like a cat. A cat is like very similar to other predators that a bird is going to experience, you know, like they've been evolving for a long time um, to recognize predators or, or be sensitive to that type of threat. And a turbine is just like such a different type of threat that I don't think I don't think that there's a ton of hope. There's maybe some, and maybe there's some hope in terms of like, oh, if certain birds just happen to migrate higher, like some individuals tend to migrate really high and they pass that on to their offspring or whatever, then then maybe there's some hope, but it's more, still more about just like random variation being beneficial than it is about like learning to avoid. That would be my guess. That's interesting, by the way. I, I just, I'm so glad that uh, Gentleman Gold, Susan North, and, and David Howden, of course, is here. Thank you. Thank you for joining us in the new place, Walt. I can see. So sorry, now, now I found you. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Good to see you all. That's wonderful. Yeah. So, what about some comments here on um, Facebook? Because I'm just seeing Heather says, I read a post on Facebook from a lady who had a wind farm uh, built near her property, and she says the noise is awful has driven away wildlife she used to see. Also, my brother-in-law visited a nearby wind farm and he said lots of dead birds under the wind turbines. So that's a comment there. Yeah, yeah and I should comment too, like where the wind turbines are placed has a big effect on, um, on what animals are killed there potentially. And that's why they don't just study what animals are dying at one wind farm. They, you know, study animals dying at, in different regions of the country, different countries, different types of placements like offshore versus ridgeline versus in a flat prairie. Um, so in, in general, more bird or more brats are killed than birds, but certainly I think some placements can be very bad for 
birds more so than others. But you know, you know, Georgia, I'm still very positive about wind uh, wind power. You know, I have to bring our old. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're learning a lot about like where to put them and stuff and also yes. turbine design. I don't know. There's like that picture. Oh, yeah. So so first of all, yeah, yeah you know what general. I'm saying here, right? Yeah. <laughs> putting, things in, putting things into perspective, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in general, yeah, wind turbines don't kill as many birds as, say, cats do, especially free roaming or feral cats. And windows like we had lost. Um, yeah. Windows. I, I mean, this is not an excuse, you know. I mean, you know, biologists like Georgia and, and others are doing incredibly important work, you know, don't get me wrong. At the same time, I don't know if you've heard of it, but I'm, I live in British Columbia. We're going through another crisis now. It's really disturbing. We've had rainfalls like we've never had before. For example, I'm in the Okanagan. I'm completely isolated now from, from Vancouver. So, the you know, we are living in, in, in a in, in the world of climate change, global warming, and so on, and and um, the weather patterns are changing, things are changing, and we have to be more aware. Uh, just like um, um, a gentleman may, uh, said earlier, start saving electricity. You know, they're, 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 these things have to happen on many fronts. Wind energy is not just one thing, and I, I think we have to be careful not to become, you know, so emotional that we that 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 because we like wildlife and we see some birds being killed, which is a fact mm -hmm. that that we that we completely condemn wind energy. We need to, you know, we need to tackle the, you know, the world energy crisis on all fronts, and and we have to change the way we live. Really, so yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But on the other hand, like mm -hmm. people are also working to address like bird deaths in these other sources that you have mm -hmm. here. You know, like people are pushing for like keeping your cats inside more or and like reducing populations of yep. free roaming or feral cats. So I, I do think it's important to keep that. I think it's good that people are working on solutions in all these different areas. Um, I mean, another wind turbine solution that's come about, um, you know, we talked about being careful with placement mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. these sort of deterrent factors people are working on, like the sound and the color, but there's also different designs for different shapes of wind turbines, right? Yes. Um, and so, yeah, and then you, you collect, I can tell by your concentrated face that you're looking for the picture. Here's yes, the picture. Second. I'm just going to enlarge it a bit here. That's, yeah. that's, I've seen these before. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's a, I think a Darius design also, if I remember correctly. Yeah. I've seen this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, what did you call it? A Darius design? Uh, some, something like that is after the engineer. I have to look it up. I, I remember this from mm -hmm. many years ago, but so, so I think something like that. I have to, I have to check, Georgia. Yeah. So I, when I, hear of turbines like this talked mm -hmm. about i hear them called vertical axis turbines. vertical axis correct yeah, yeah it's yeah. just like a general term because this you know the axis mm -hmm. is this way and then the blades are like spinning around this way which is different than you know the standard turbines we've been looking looking at where like the um they're spinning horizontal axis and the blades are spinning around this way um so these vertical axis turbines i know have much much lower death rates for bats at least I don't know about for birds, but they they kill far fewer animals. Um, I don't know how efficient they are or if they're equally as efficient as the other turbines, though, in terms of generating power. Yeah, system. I can answer that straight away. Unfortunately, not. Um, otherwise, mm -hmm. I think they would, you know, this, this, let me explain why yeah. wind farms are as big as they are. I'm going to go to the offshore wind farm again. So, mm -hmm. so it, it's, um, you know, I'm not talking about animals, I'm just purely the efficiency of wind. So the maximum wind efficiency that you can ever get is about 60%. That, uh, that, that means that the wind that comes in doesn't just stop behind. There's always wind going through. You can do a, you do, can do a calculation and, 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 and calculate that. So um, it also happens to be so that, that, the larger the area, the cross section that a turbine can capture from the wind, the, the, the better it is, right? So it is proportional to the scale. That's why they're trying to make them bigger and bigger. And also, the fewer you need outside, the less, uh, you know, the less impact they they actually have, and putting putting many on. So from an efficiency point of view, from an electrical engineering point of view, there's no doubt that scaling up makes makes complete sense but you but this is mainly offshore right onshore there the the the, the case is very limited um, the biggest wind farms that we know now are being built off the shore of of, of the UK um, you know that's uh, that's the prime area in, in the world 
However, so having said that, yeah. Oh, real quick. So when you talk about the size, you're talking about the size of the individual turbine and the size of the wind farm in terms of number of turbines. Yeah, that's right. But it's mainly also the individual size. Uh, okay. So they, they don't yeah. make those vertical axis turbines as big. No, as no, these they, do, no they, can, they cannot. This is, the, in, in comparison, the one that you're seeing is rather small, unfortunately. So that's that's more for, you know, maybe for a farm or so if you have indiv your individual mm -hmm. power. That would make sense, but on a large scale, unfortunately, that's not possible, right? Yeah. Do you, is it because I'm trying to work out what the size limitation is? Is it because, like, when you have the vertical axis, the like, I guess, blades, for lack of a better word, are so heavy, they're yes. bigger, and so they're heavy and they don't turn as much as that? Yeah, it's it's quite simple. It's the cross-sectional area that you sweep that determines how much power you have, and and and. Uh, you can see that the you know the three blade system sweeps an incredibly large area. You you, you I mean it's it's the, the it's it's proportional to the area. So the lot you know it's not the radius. It's the so if it's a hundred meter long or three hundred fifty feet, you're you're you you you're covering a huge area which you on the vertical uh, from a stability point of view simply cannot cannot do in the same way. Right. Gotcha. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> but but anyway, you, you know it's it's like with everything we we, we have to ba we have to balance things. I'm still a big wind fan. A fan, mm -hmm. you know, maybe you'll be surprised, but I really I really am. I think to harness wind power is very important, and it is to harness all kinds of different energies that is that is going to determine whether we make it as a human race or not. You know, so. Mm -hmm. Oh, we doing. have a comment um, on the Facebook from Diane Elizabeth. She says, I pulled two stock photos of purple wind turbines to add to the comments for you, but no way to add the photo here. Oh, oh thank you for thank you for your efforts, though, Diane. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I encourage everyone to Google, I guess, photos of purple wind turbines. Um, yeah. And then another comment from Janice Lawrence. That's very appropriate. Sadly, every source of power has impacts on wildlife and the environment. Yes. Along with mitigating risks as consumers, we must use less. Janice, you're exactly right. And that was really well stated. Um, yeah, everything has its different pros and cons. I don't think we've talked about solar. I forget. Maybe we did talk about solar. We'll, we'll talk about well. solar separately. How's that? We'll do it separately. And I just can't water. remember if we already did talk about it. Though. You talked about <laughs> it alone. You, 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 you had your own three, but that wasn't part of our show, right? You oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's why I'm getting confused. Yeah, so we can do an episode on solar too. That's another great example. Um, I think they all have different ways of of mitigating the risk. And it's not, you know, it's probably good to use a bunch of different energy sources as much as possible. And um, with solar, for example, yeah, like just briefly, a big problem with solar is that uh, a great place to put solar panels is in the desert, for example, but then you're creating a big shaded area. And in someplace where you normally get a lot of sunlight. And so that can be bad for the animals there that want a bright, sunny desert, not a desert covered with solar panels. Um, but you can put solar panels, for example, on your house. And that's a great way to reduce the risks I of agree. solar, yeah. yeah. Um, and so with wind turbines though, like I've seen people with little like wind turbines on their house and mm -hmm. that would probably not be a great way because um, like we're talking about the placement and the design of the turbines is really important. And so like, yeah, maybe it's best to just say, okay, this is a good area to have all these wind turbines and we can kind of control them and, and keep them off during migration season or if the wind isn't going very fast anyways. And that's maybe a great solution for mitigating risks with wind, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually super happy that this technically worked, Georgia, because we, we managed to do Facebook and, 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 and YouTube. So I'm super excited that we actually managed to do this and uh, got, got, got it working. Um, I, I just wanted to say quickly, I know that David Halden is, is, is on, on HAPS, of course, and, and um, maybe some of you too. Uh, it would be interesting if you just leave a comment. How did you find the quality of what we're doing now as compared to HAPS? What are the advantages and disadvantages? So just put them in the comments, please, because it really helps us. And also because we can give that type of feedback to HAPS. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, th that's a great, um, that's a great point, Christian. So 
definitely we're in a transition time right now with the show, like figuring out how we want to go about streaming on a regular basis going forward. Mm -hmm. um, we are putting together a website. And so hopefully that'll yes. be a centralized place it will be a centralized place where regardless of the platform that we use to stream, you can see the episodes. And I think that'll also be really fun because um, I'll be writing up little, you know, blog entries on each past episode. So it'll be great to have um, our guests and their work highlighted in a, in a fun way where you can revisit them and, and go to their personal websites and stuff. By the way, I just see Osprey Mama here. Fantastic. I'll have to tell you quickly about Osprey Mama. Fantastic. She's there. She's from Florida, an absolute Osprey fan. Very knowledgeable in, um, uh, in in wildlife, especially you know, of course, osprey. Right, that's her 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 knowledge here. Wonderful to see you here. And she used to be the moderator who helped me put all the comments together. So osprey, Baba, hint hint. Maybe you'll be able to put the comments together in future if we have to stay this way. We don't know yet, but you've been a wonderful help. She she was always sending me comments from everyone, and and so that that really helped a lot. So I just wanted to say hello and thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And thank you everyone for tuning in. We really appreciate it. And, um, and one way that you can show your appreciation for us besides tuning in is to make sure to like, like, and subscribe and all that, wherever you're watching from. Yeah. Um, th and, and thank you so much. And if you have any uh, particular topic that you would like to hear about, write to us. We'll take it up. There are so many topics. George, are you going to be there next week? I thought maybe I'm on. Yeah. My so yeah. yeah. And first of all, I want to say thank you. Someone else, uh, Part of why we did this topic this week is because someone suggested it last week. And so, and here it is. And I wish I could remember off the top of my head who suggested it, um, but thank you. And Christian, you are correct that I will probably not be here, at least in live world, I won't be here next week. I'm um, going to Chile for the rock climbing trip, um, racking up the CO2 emissions. <laughs> um, well, one thing I was thinking of doing, because I am going to meet my friend there, who's also a wildlife biologist, um, I might try to send you video clips, Christian, that you could maybe include. Of course. Like, of you know, of here's all the wildlife camera traps we've collected. I, I don't know, based on the timing of the trip, I might not be able to send them before Wednesday, but I think that we will have either next week or the week after an episode that touches on... Um, on explorations in Chile. And so wow, I think that'll be that's cool. nice. Yeah. Well, I don't know how the internet connection is, but I could get you in live if you want to, George. I, that would be wonderful. <laughs> yeah. I, I think the problem is that like on Wednesday is maybe when I'm going to be not mm. in internet world and like actually climbing. Um, so, but maybe before then I'll have a chance to send you some stuff or yeah, maybe it'll get roped into the episode after. I'll, I'll send something we should be talking about in private, not live, but whatever. I'll send a drone to stop you and then we can all see you. <laughs> I, I wish, I wish, yeah, we had, I guess, a couple episodes back where we had the drone footage of climbing, the um, wildlife yeah. and climbing episode. And uh, and I'm not bringing my drone on this trip. I'm not, it's too much flying and we have to hike too far to get to the climbing. It's not worth it to bring the drone, sadly, but. One, one quick comment here from Heather. Let me just bring it in. Maybe you know something about this, Georgia. I will, yes, I was wondering if a little windmill, so a little windmill, should probably a small windmill, for aerating my pond would be dangerous for wildlife, so I hesitated to purchase one. Do you have any comment on that? Um, hmm. I, yeah, I don't know. I think if it's a small turbine, then I don't think it would be very harmful because like, if it's small, then you're not building up very much speed at the tips. Um, but definitely, Heather, if you want, um, send me like a private message. I see that you're on Facebook. So send me a private Facebook message and we can talk more about like what type of turbine it is and how, and how big and stuff like that. And that might give me a better idea. But the short answer is if it's small, it's probably not gonna be that bad. Good. And then, thank you. There's some more comments. Um, so, so thanks. Thanks for all your comments. So, um, and, and, um, I haven't uh, thought about the topic yet for next week, but I'll be on my own and Georgia will be climbing somewhere <laughs> in, in, uh, well, withering heights. <laughs> yeah. I guess, yeah, I guess I'll say probably I won't be here next week and probably in two weeks there will be uh, an episode that includes a lot of footage from, from Chile. Great. Well, 
wonderful trip and th thank you everyone for joining we appreciate your, your spontaneity and also your tolerance to jump to new media we'll try and go back to Haps. i just read uh, david halden's comment that he really likes to see the, the um you know the the uh, comments of everybody from all the channels i completely agree and i do i do see his points which which at the moment i cannot realize maybe there's a technical way of doing it but david i would have to look into this i just hope I really hope that Haps comes better. You know, uh, to 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 work in a portrait mode is extremely sad. I think because you know there's so many beautiful things that we want to show you that our eyes are horizontal. That's what I always say. You know, and not not in portrait mode. I've never seen any any vertical cinema so far, but who knows, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Thank you oh, for joining. Yeah. Yes, and thank you very.